Dear participants of this Atelier Valletta, dear mentors, dear honorary guests, often this is set in reverse order, but today and the next seven days, you, the participants of these ateliers, are our VIPs or our honorary guests. Who are you? 32 people coming from 22 countries and all continents, coming from different art disciplines, regions, social backgrounds with hopefully an eagerness to meet other people, to meet the other who might think differently than you, who might be living in a completely different reality than you, who might feel and look different than you, to be open to this other, to be challenged, provoked, put out of your comfort zone, but more importantly, I think, to find what connects us what makes each and every one of us this unique human being with aspirations, dreams, challenges, fears. We have seven days ahead of us for a conversation to reflect critically on festivals and their role in society today, and most importantly, to share and inspire each other. We have prepared together with Mike van Graan, who is sitting completely in the back, uh, this program and who will facilitate you through the seven days, <clears throat> which is based on your expectations which you formulated in your application forms, and we highlighted that already this afternoon. Such as there are networking international, international collaborations, sharing and learning, self-reflection process, learn new festival management skills, gain new insights and inspirations, to formulate questions, to give project ideas, to start new collaborations, skills as fundraising and sustainability, curating and programming, sustaining and developing audiences and working internationally and with diverse artists, but also issues as freedom of expression, festivals as agents for, for social change. And as some of you said, uh, one of you said this, this afternoon and that came as a surprise, to be surprised and to get some hardcore thinking um, and to be re revolutionized together. And hopefully also some good Maltese food in the next seven days. Together with Festivals Malta, we have positioned this program in the context where we are today. And I hope you enjoyed your walk already this afternoon. In days to come, you will discover much more of the cultural scene here, of the artists working here, the way art is working with refugees and much more. And all of this put within the context of today. In the context of Malta, which historically features as a crossroads of cultures and people, in the context of Europe and in the context of the world today. So let's see where we are today. Today is the day when a girl in Sweden decided to tell the adults that they are not doing their job properly and to take action into our own hands and who has mobilized in the meantime thousands of school children everywhere to follow in our footsteps. Who said one person cannot change the world? Anyway, who are those adults? Politicians? What should be the job description of a good politician? What do we think their role in society should be? Let's try something. To create a sustainable future where next generations can continue to live a quality life? To encourage citizenship, that people feel they have a responsibility and feel empowered to act for their cities, the life in it, with other human beings. To create a sense of togetherness instead of polarizing communities and generating fear of the other, question mark. To make mistakes and be accountable for those mistakes. We all make mistakes, no? To formulate answers and solutions to challenging issues as climate change, mass migration, economic instability. To take care of a healthy economic system, a healthcare system, creating solidary and tolerant societies. To foresee quality education for all, and access to arts and culture, for ministers to have knowledge about the domain they are responsible for. Imagine what we could do with a minister of culture or a minister of arts who is actually informed, involved, and interested in the arts to put things above the table, to be transparent, to be courageous, to be leaders. While my 10-year-old son is marching for the climate in Brussels with thousands of others, today we, so, we see a sort of infantile figures 
who orders spraying 16 million acres with a bee-killing pesticide in a time of global insect decline. Trying to cross the, bees trying to cross the Mexican border as they might sting, figuratively speaking, New leaders who want to cut up the lungs of the, Amazon, of, the, of the world, the Amazon. Destructive leaders, outright criminals, who are not accountable when being called upon their responsibilities, who degrade women, encourage racism and xenophobia, who say to speak for the majority but exclude and or persecute minorities, propose easy so-called solutions which, as we know, history has shown us can result in the killing of millions of people. And if I refer to, the, to, do, to today, I'm of, of course opposed to refer also to the New Zealand mosque killings. But instead, <clears throat> I choose to refer to the public school shooting, which is much less publicized in the global south, which Luis uh, pointed out yesterday in Brazil last week. Racism and xenophobia are real and pose a threat to social inclusion and could, if not addressed, cause social exclusion and communal strife. Europe, as well as the Western world, are facing a mounting challenge to their core values of solidarity, fueled by populist politics and toxic public narratives that create a climate of fear. It is here that leadership is required to engage with those communities who are, for one reason or another, facing challenges. This is what Kain Ismail, the UN Refugee Agency representative to Malta says. This January, 49 refugees were stranded at the sea, finally being allowed to embark in Malta as a symptom of Europe's failing refugee policy. They have been sailing back and forth in the Maltese seas for 19 days after Italy, Malta, and all other EU countries refused to offer them a port of safety. The past weeks have not been Europe's finest hour. If human values and solidarity are not upheld, there is no Europe, said EU Migration Commissioner Dimitris Avramopoulos. The Prime Minister of Malta complained that his country has to bear an unfair share of migrant numbers. But what is unfair in the light of humanitarian crisis? or just people looking for a better life, or just people having risked their life stranded on the Mediterranean? And what is that fair share compared to neighboring countries of conflict who take almost a third of their population in? How much space do we have? How much space are we ready to give up or to share? Should policy be made at the expense of people in distress? Some 113 482,000 migrants crossed the Mediterranean to reach Europe last year. According to the UN Refugee Agency, which says 2,260 people lost their lives or went missing making the journey. Still nothing compared to the 1.5 million Syrian refugees Lebanon has taken in on a population of 6 million today. Of course, it's not a black and white story, and Malta has through its history been a place where refugees have been and are still welcomed, as in 1972, where some 400 Ugandan Asians refugees settled briefly in Malta when Idi Amin expelled them during his uh, ethnic minority uh, expelling. They settled at uh, Tinya Barracks, which I think you visited during your walk. At one point, a group of 36 refugees were taken on an educational tour to the National Museum and the Palace in Valletta by the Minister of Education and Culture. The UN Refugee Agency in Malta made a magazine in 2018, Moving Forward, to give a face to the refugees and their stories. Efforts are being made. And I really like the, what Ibrahim said during the session today. Migration is a habit. It has always been done in Europe. In, it is just the way that you look at it. And refugees have a message also, and we need to listen to their stories. Each refugee that receives <clears throat> a place has, of course, needs. And many are struggling because they lack access to sustainable inclusion prospects. They face difficulties to access stable and predictable work, situations of homelessness, and legal and policy impediments for family reunification. Not only political decisions or courage, but also public perception and rhetoric matter in this sense. Politicians should speak responsibly and seek to reinforce what holds us together. 
rather than which divides us. The media should use its powerful voice and position, as well as the terminology used, the reasons provided in the rise of refugee influx and the solution suggestions in a way that conveys accurate information so that citizens can make sense of the world and their place within it. Sensational rhetoric makes headlines, but it does, little to under it does very little to understand people who had to forcibly leave their homes. And finally, each and every one of us can do our part in making our communities better places to live in. So next time you meet a refugee at work or at the shops, take the extra step to say hello and get to know the person, continues the UN representative of Malta. And that is exactly the question I want to come to. Who are those adults? Politicians or also we? What can we do as festival managers, as people? Can we also be leaders, like Greta, for example? Can we be courageous in the times ahead of us? Art, fe art festivals are bridging platforms, or as Louis said today, crossroads, with a direct link to people, civil society structures, and public authorities. They are meeting places. They represent communities, different value and belief systems. At a time when challenges are put on freedom of movement and association, festivals can be excellent platforms for exchanging ideas, meeting and forming identities. It can be safe places where different viewpoints and beliefs can coexist. Art is the safest place to have a dangerous conversation, as Robin mentioned in one of the ateliers um, before. The European Festivals Association was set up for this purpose, and IFA is a community of art festival makers founded in 1952 after the Second World War, to create bridges and reduce the distance between festivals and communities. Today, with the Festival Academy and new tools such as the interactive website festivalfinder.eu, IFA is becoming a wee story, linking people and organizations active in the arts field. It's a story that is reaching beyond Europe, as it strives to consolidate interaction between continents, countries, cultures, and people, so that there can be mutual inspiration, influence, and confrontation. IFA guides the discourse on the value of arts festival, a sector that is so unique and that shares a myriad of concerns on intellectual, artistic, material, and organizational level, deserves a strong collective that supports local initiatives and gives arts festivals a unified voice as an informed expression of organized civil society. So one of the crucial questions of this program is how and if festivals can be agents for social change, for social cohesion, for strengthening of human rights values and platforms for democracy. I want to take a small diversion at this point and I would like to share with you some of the results of the 7th St. Petersburg International Cultural Forum in Russia. For your information, this 7th edition included 35,000 people from 300 participants when it was started in 2012. The topic of the seventh edition was culture as the country's strategic potential. And I quote, people in Russia have first-hand knowledge of greatness of this potential of culture. Our country is uniquely diverse in terms of languages and traditions. They have been intertwining for centuries, nourished each other and gave our painters, writers and musicians the power and inspiration to create cultural brands of quite literally global value. Of course, we are very proud of that. Most importantly, they gave us an intrinsic understanding of the peacemaking mission of culture. It brings nations together, sometimes even despite political disagreements and economic challenges, and spreads supreme values of humanism, equality, and mutual respect. These are the words of no one less than President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, at the gala opening of this conference. Putin knows very well what the impact of culture can be and how to use this for, as he calls it, the country's strategic potential. Culture to make Russia great again. And for all of you who have been sleeping <laughs> until now, I'm not advocating for Putin. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. So one of the questions for the next days would be for me, which language do we need to use today if the same language is used by world leaders as Vladimir Putin, who in their actual acts and policies are silencing people, locking them up for speaking out, and who might be responsible for ethnic cleansing? 
What is the meaning of freedom of expression within a context where politicians are seemingly unaccountable, as there are no consequences when people do speak out against some of the malpractices, or there are, but mainly for those speaking out? What is the impact or danger of self-censorship when you are dependent on state funding? How far are you prepared to go? How many journalists need to be murdered or photographers need to be locked up first? Might there be a time that it is too late to react? Should we accept public funding with strings attached to our core values? What are the effects of cultural boycott in these contexts? And I have to mention that I heard ironically today that the place we are in now, which is like a restored place, an old food market, which was, um, which in one way is of course beautiful and it's great and it's an element for tourism and people are happy to come here. But on the other hand, there seems to be an unofficial cultural boycott for this place because the local communities are pushed out because the food stalls are too expensive for them. So the old woman around the corner will not come to buy her tomatoes here today. There is a, this is a sort of, which brings me exactly to the next question. How do we safeguard the artistic value and quality of art and art festivals? And for example, uh, huge initiatives as European capitals of culture not to be recuperated for marketing purposes. What is our responsibility as festival managers, artistic directors, artists regarding these challenges? Where are our limitations and what can we do? We can complain about our politicians, but do we really know their position and perspective and their challenges? Could we have a conversation with them and see how we can help to create more social inclusion, citizenship, etc., from the platforms we have? Or do we, are they too corrupt and do we need to Form, form another platform for that. Concretely, how to position ourselves and which actions we can take through words, through artworks, or through the artists we program, through the voices we allow to be heard or not, through organizing ourselves, through our audiences and communities we are in contact with, through our festivals. What do you believe is needed today and what role can you play in this? We, I am interested in your answers. To so think in the next seven days, to do some hardcore thinking. What can we do when we go home? What happens the day we leave this atelier? Guided by people coming from all over the world from different fields of actions, like Robin Archer, Luis Corradazzi, Faisal Kiweva, Roy Luxford, Brett Piper, Shahidul Alam, Mike van Graan, Annabel Stivala, Malta Festivals, and of course the many people we will meet locally going from artists, festival managers, refugees, etc. The unique programs of the Festival Academy bring together an enormous variety of creative minds. With the purpose of generating positive change, using creativity to imagine a world where future generations can still live in peace with each other, regardless different belief systems and values where more fair ways and sustainable ways of collaboration are being considered and practiced, where we anticipate to look into opportunities and ch challenges the digital revolution brings along for festivals and much more. To generate awareness about festivals and their role in society, their capacity to be vehicles for social change, social cohesion, strengthening human rights values and global identities, with the aim to create a more open and tolerant society possibly driven by fear and adrenaline, as Robin said uh, earlier, and in a constant state of emergency. We're always so much looking forward to what is coming and our next festival and who to program, but what can we do now? For all these programs and formats that we are doing, we are in constant conversation with festivals around the world, politicians, artists, festival managers, universities, and different foundations. And of course, with the alumni network, who to of all the people who took part so far, who counts today 600 people from more than 80 countries and all continents. This seven days is just the beginning, and you will become part of this network, and we invite you also to come to Lisbon in April um, to take part in the yearly summit of the European Festivals Association, where we will work uh, to further construct this first global network of festival managers. I would like to thank also especially our partners who help us in making this conversation more inclusive, as the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture, the ICOR Refugee Network, the Korea Arts Council, Malta Arts Council, um, the European 
in the EU Japan Fest, Ulysses 2021, WeJet, Italia festivals, whose support has been essential for many of you to be here today. And of course, Creative Europe and the European Commission, whose support is, is um, unmissable in making this conversation possible. Huge thanks to Festival Malta for organizing this with us, for Annabelle, Janelle, Mario, Monique, and all the members of the teams, to Mr. Marshall, to the Ministry of Culture, and to the Malta Arts Council. Uh, also to Laura of the Festival Academy, who's standing behind uh, <laughs> the screen, and Alice, who will arrive later today, I think, for uh, preparing this with me. And of course, special thanks to Mike van Graan, to put this program together with us. So I all invite you in the next days to listen to each other, to share, to get inspired, and to use our joint creativity to formulate some questions and possible answers and actions in the next days, and especially to meet this new group of friends to build trust, solidarity, and openness towards each other. But first, we will now have our minds provoked by Shaidul Alam, and I'm exercising to get your, noun, your name uh, pronounced properly. The Bangladesh reclaimed photographer and initiator of the first photo festival in Bangladesh, who I'm so honored uh, that he can be here with us today. So the floor is all yours.